If somebody tells you they can predict the future, you shouldn't believe them, especially if they're from California. <laughs> but somehow, for the last 50 years, this little think tank up in Palo Alto, Institute for the Future, has been doing 10-year forecasting. And we actually keep track. One of the first questions you should always ask a futurist is, have you outlived your forecasts? <laughs> We have five times over, and we're usually right. So we keep track, 50 years was our anniversary last year, and over those 50 years, 60 to 80% of our forecasted futures have actually happened, depending on your definition of happened. <laughs> but it turns out that's not the way you evaluate a futurist. That's the way you evaluate a fortune teller. You know, did the predicted future happen? We don't do that. What we do, is a forecast, a plausible, internally consistent, provocative view of what we think will happen, and it's designed to provoke your insight whether you believe in the forecast or not. So our challenge here today, our wonderful opportunity today, and what an amazing group we have, our opportunity is to think 10 years ahead and ask what kind of leaders will thrive? What kind of leadership will thrive. And I'm going to share with you some of the tools that we teach at Institute for the Future and give you a chance to take those tools and apply them for the rest of the day. So here's the three topics I want to introduce. And we're going to do it in a series of iterations. I'm actually going to try to do table talk and have conversations and Q&A in spite of the room size we have here. And I must admit, I've been highly influenced by my neuroscience friends. I did the uh, keynote talk last fall for the Neuro Leadership Summit in New York with 750 people in the room, 35,000 online, they told me. And it was billed as the most brain-friendly conference ever held. <laughs> and what they taught me was always speak in small chunks. So that's what I'm going to do today, roughly 15, 20 minutes. Now, they also had an interesting resource. They gave us a neuroscience as an adult supervisor who interpreted everything I said. So I had Kevin Oxner from Columbia following me around interpreting. So when I said, you can't predict the future, Kevin said, that's right, but that's what our brains do all the time anyway. <laughs> so there is this sense now in which neuroscience is getting practical. So we're going to do three chunks, one on strategic foresight. I'm going to share our basic toolkit, one on full spectrum thinking, which is a new book I'm working on, one on the new leadership, leadership uh, literacies, which is my current book and which is more directly linked to this conference. So here's the secret of 50 years of doing 10-year forecasting. This is the Institute for the Future's logo. It was actually originally designed by our lead designer, Gene Hagen, originally designed on an Etch-a-Sketch. Remember that? And it is a continuous line function, as the future is. But it's really hard to read it, uh, I-F-T-F. But the more you hold it back, the more clear. It becomes. That's the secret. That's the secret of 10-year forecasting. It's actually easier to look 10 years ahead than it is one or two years ahead. We're often asked in Silicon Valley especially, how can you do 10-year forecasting? I can't even do one or two. The reason is because it's easier. So why can't we do that? And that's the skill I'd like to introduce for us today. So the future we're looking at, we do a rolling um, annual 10-year forecast. And the single word that summarizes the next decade, we think, this world of toxic misinformation and distrust, the single word is scramble. Scramble. It's going to be a scramble. I teach now at the Army War College, and I get the new three-star generals on their first week in Washington. Uh, they use this new leadership literacies book as a way of figuring out how do you lead in this world where it is a scramble, where many things that have been stuck will get unstuck. And the question is, will they unravel? Uh, and our forecast is the people who are good at the unsticking will not be very good at putting them back together again. So there's going to be an extreme number of unintended consequences. But the good news, the silver lining, is it's going to be a ripe time for innovation if you can get beyond these polarities of the present. So 
I'm going to share with you now two driving forecasts. Even in the world of the scramble, what the Army War College calls the VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Even in this world, I'm sure this is true. Anything that can be distributed will be distributed. And I mean distributed, not just decentralized. The internet is and will be an amplifier. And Michelle Dean, the author, said it so well. Authority has become something diffuse and flammable, like spray paint. So when I do these sessions for the new three stars, the first one I did, I followed Bob Woodward, and I preceded Madeleine Albright. Very tough role. And this was Madeleine Albright's new book at the time. It's an amazing book called Fascism, A Warning. I recommend it highly, but I'm not nearly that pessimistic. Um, I'm actually optimistic because I don't believe fascism scales in this world. I don't believe you can control in a world where anything that can be distributed will be distributed. I do believe you can make short-term progress, and we're seeing that around the world. I don't believe it's sustainable. The second forecast, the future will reward clarity, and what the military calls this is commander's intent or mission command or flexive command. Be very clear where you're going, very flexible how you get there. The future will reward clarity, but punish, punish certainty. And again, it'll reward it in the short term at times, but it's going to punish it in the long term. My colleague, Jane McGonigal, now teaches a course on foresight and neuroscience at, the, uh, at Stanford. And one of her conclusions is we usually think of trust and distrust as direct opposites. But in the brain, trust and distrust are two entirely separate systems. They're not opposite ends of the same continuum. And here's fMRI data. I'm going to share all these slides with you, by the way, through Pepperdine, so you're welcome to use them. I'm just going to ask that you keep them internal because a lot of these things aren't published. Uh, and here's the summary. Trust is rational, hard to build, and fragile, created through direct experience. So in the middle of the scramble, you're trying to create a mood of trust, and it's really hard. On the other hand, distrust is emotional, a different part of your brain. Easy to build and resilient. You can seed distrust with rumor and secondhand information. And social media don't work very well for building trust, but they do work great for kindling mistrust. So here's the model, and then we'll open it for questions. Foresight, insight, action. It always begins with hindsight, your stories from the past. And the neuroscientists call this your own personal neural story net. And we all have it. We don't have any choice. And what I try as a futurist is to break in to your neural story net with a story from the future. Plausible, internally consistent, provocative with signals to bring it to life. Designed to provoke your insight. And an insight, an insight is an aha. And once you have an insight, you can't go back. So ideas are important, but insights are rare. And the way we get evaluated is not does the forecasted future happen, because we don't believe in prediction, but does the foresight provoke an insight that leads to a better decision in the present? So you'll notice stories being used in each case. DARPA, our Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, funded this research with neuroscientists and master storytellers. And they concluded that our brains are wired for stories. If our brains don't hear stories, they make them up. They make them up. Now, I, this isn't new to me. I learned this in divinity school. Most of the world's religions completely get this. But what's new is now we have data. We have data. We have fMRI data. This is just a fact of life if you're going to be a leader. So here's the shift I think we need to go through, and then I'm going to open the conversation to you. What most organizations do is now, next, future, present forward strategy, or what's often called horizon one, horizon two, horizon three. Now, that's reasonable, but it doesn't work nearly as well in a scramble. So what I'm suggesting is that you learn from foresight, and you need to do now, future, next, because it's actually easier to look 10 years ahead than one or two. And I got to do the closing keynote for Clayton Christensen at his InnoSight Strategy CEO Summit in August. And what InnoSight is calling this now is future back visioning 
or feature back strategy. And it fits perfectly with what I'm arguing that we need to do, foresight, insight, action, but to go forward 10 years and work backwards, not just work from the present forward. So with this as a conversation starter, I'm going to ask that you refer to your tables, to have a table conversation about this model. Does this make sense to you? Does it not? Uh, upstairs, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you, or and some of you have a little room, you could cluster in groups of three or four if you want, and spend just about five minutes at the table. Does this model make sense? And what the neuroscientists tell us is when you suggest a different way of thinking, you've got to give your brain time to process. So give your brain time to process. Think about foresight, insight, action, and have a conversation. Then we'll come back and we'll spend five minutes, and I want to get at least one question or comment from the ground floor and at least one question or comment from above. Five minutes, please. OK, welcome back. Um, I'm going to start with a question or comment from down on the ground level here. Do you have one to get us rolling? Question or comment? Ah, the first one. This is a leadership opportunity. Right, right here. OK, right here is one, right just behind you. We have Behind the post. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. In your discussion of cognitive science, uh, I didn't hear you talk much about behavioral economics. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Dr. Kyle Murphy. I'm practitioner faculty of strategy here uh -huh. at the school. Oh, cool. Um, uh, my doctorate's in behavioral economics. So nice. I'm coming from my own angle from it. Nice. But all decisions in business are economic, and yes. all decisions are behavioral. Yes. So, connecting those pieces. So I was just wondering how you look at your model and working with the cognitive scientists connecting to behavioral economics theory yeah, and I'm I think heuristics. Yeah, I'm so glad you, you added that. Um, it's vital and you know, since I was in graduate school, behavioral economics has kind of changed the whole concept of economics as we understand it and built bridges to psychology and sociology, my basic training, plus anthropology, I guess. Um, but where, where I see that fitting in is it certainly fits in in terms of hindsight, foresight, and definitely insight, because the insights coming out of behavioral economics, I think, are so much more profound. So Procter & Gamble is the company I've worked with the longest time. Um, we, our current custom forecast for them is on the future of advertising. They're the world's largest advertiser. They've been believers in behavioral economics for at least a decade. They've got a deep water guy, Craig Wynette, who studies that, and they've worked with Dan Ariely and others in this field. Um, so if you think about advertising from a behavioral economics and from a foresight point of view, it's obvious 10 years from now, advertising as we know it is dead. The kids will kill it, if nobody else. And if you look at kids watching television, if they do at all, they watch with two or three other screens open at the same time. They're really good curators. They are not consumers in the passive sense. They want engagement, you know, preferably gameful engagement. So it's a really big deal. Um, Mark Pritchard, their chief branding officer, said at CES this year, Ads as we know them are dead. That's the world's largest advertiser. <laughs> That's a message for, for all of us. One more question up from up above, please. I'm having trouble seeing you, but you have a competitive advantage in terms of the ability to see down. Yeah. Or is a question or a comment from up above? This is a leadership opportunity. Here's one right down here, right down here. There's a, uh, always an inverse correlation between the person who asks the first question and the location of the microphone, uh, and this proves that concept. Yes, but thank you, sir. And could you introduce yourself, too, when you, you get started? It's going to be hard for them to see you down here, but don't lean over too far. <laughs> My name is Daniel Lovett. I am a uh, staff member at Pepperdine and a current fully employed MBA student. Uh, my undergraduate was in creative writing, which nice. is... Uh, a unique, a unique combination of education. Uh, my, my question is, as the, I see the word story bolded so many times, Yes. Uh, what do you see as the path to either teaching storytellers to be better business people or teaching business people to be better storytellers or uh, teaching the two of them to talk to each yes. other? Yes. Yeah, great question. Um, so 
the beginning is to realize that we all have to be storytellers. So every great leader I know is a great storyteller. It's just not an option. So if you don't tell a story, people are going to make up stories anyway. So you may as well get good at it yourself. Um, the second thing that's really interesting, and we're going to talk about this more in a moment, with this generation of young people growing up with video gaming, uh, gaming, video gaming or immersive learning or board games, those are typically story games. So it's really storytelling, but you get to be in the story. It's like a first person story. So kids who are gamers, they're natural storytellers. So that's another really interesting kind of synchronicity, I think, as we look toward the future. So the challenge for us is how do we take this storytelling and make it practical. Now to link back to my friends in the military, and I'm not a military person by background, but my life was changed by just by chance being at the Army War College the week before 9-11. And it did change my life in a fundamental way. And I've learned so much because they're really ahead of us in business at understanding how to deal with the scramble, what they call the VUCA world. And what they say is, you want to be very clear where you're going, very flexible how you get there, as I said, but that clarity has to be embedded with a good story. <laughs> so you want to be very clear where you're going, very flexible how you get there. Now, my definition of a story is emotionally laden attention. Emotionally laden attention. That's the same definition as the definition of a good game. OK, great start. Thank you. Um, now I want to introduce the notion of full spectrum thinking to try to share with you my latest thinking of where we go with foresight inside action. And I'm working with a concept now I'm calling full spectrum thinking. Uh, and the subtitle of it is How to Escape Boxes in a Post-Categorical Future. And I define full spectrum thinking this way. It's the ability to seek clarity and understanding across gradients of possibility while resisting the temptation of premature categorization or false certainty. Now, we live in an area, in a world now, particularly in politics, of very simplistic categories. And it's gotten very dangerous. Um, the good news of this forecast is our tools for full spectrum thinking are getting a lot better. And that's what I'm writing about, and that's what I'd like you to think about and talk about a little now, because it has so much to do with our assignment here today, which is to think about leaders and leadership in the future. So here's the basic shift I'm seeing. Even in a VUCA world, even in a scramble, you can usually tell directionally where things are going, even if you can't predict. And where I think things are going now is we're moving from categorical thinking, putting things in boxes, to full spectrum thinking. Uh, we had Tom Friedman, the famous New York Times uh, columnist, at our 50th anniversary celebration last fall at the Computer History Museum. And the way Tom says it is, when he is looking for a new story, he tries to go not just out of the box or beyond the box, but try to th think without any concept of boxes and hold in that space for as long as possible. Full spectrum thinking is rather natural. Kids are born with it. Our ancestors were probably better at it than we were. But we've structured ourselves out of it. And we've tricked ourselves into believing the categories are real, when in fact, they're usually not. So categorical thinking is putting new experiences in old boxes, buckets, labels, generalizations, stereotypes, categories, either or for its choice. Uh, neuroscientists in the room will say, that's what our brains do. <laughs> it's just a very natural neuroscience process, the way my colleagues have taught me. Full spectrum thinking, on the other hand, is also natural in a different way. It's seeking clarity across continuums while resisting premature categorization or false certainty. So it's both and an array of possibilities. So rather than just say when you have a new experience, this belongs in this category, you say, I can imagine it in this range, in this range. And here's the really good news, the really good news. The tools are getting so much better over the next decade. So today's tools, <clears throat> think about traditional binary computing. It's the ultimate categorization machine. Everything into zeros and ones. Now look way down the road to quantum, which is all about amplitudes. You know, so the metaphor the quantum people use is now we're flipping a coin, heads or tails, 
in quantum, you're spinning the coin, and the faster it spins, the more powerful it becomes. Now, I'm not suggesting that's practical in the next decade, but it's directionally correct. So what you're going to see, I think, is a whole series of clarity filters. We're seeing the first indications of them in Silicon Valley now. Big data analytics, visualization, machine learning, gameful engagement, XR, or blended reality. So not just full virtual, but augmented or mixed reality and neuroscience understanding. So this is Zach Anderson. This is what we call a signal. Uh, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed, as William Gibson said so eloquently. So Zach is the head of big data analytics at EA, the, one of the world's largest gaming companies. I brought a group of senior executives there last summer. Uh, and here's what he said. I like distributions, not lines. I don't like to normalize. He doesn't like statistics. Now we can look at full distributions and see the patterns. He also explained to us in a game like FIFA, very popular game, they're tracking every click of every mouse of every player of every game anonymously. But it creates a big data array where you can study and get inside the distribution. So I say, just in time, just in time, because this is what we need because the VUCA world will require leaders to do full spectrum thinking anyway. And aided by gaming, big data analytics, visualization, neuroscience, blockchain is, I think, a first step. Machine learning, leaders will be able to do full spectrum thinking. So bringing this back to networks, right now we have mass media or social media that carve us up into categories. So if you're conservative, you watch Fox. If you're liberal, you watch MSNBC. And we're in central authority networks, essentially. But if you look at tomorrow, it's distributed authority computing. And again, blockchain's just a first step. Blended reality, movement toward, toward quantum. So I showed you this earlier. The future will reward clarity but punish certainty. <clears throat> the future will, I believe, reward full spectrum thinking but punish, punish categorical thinking. It'll just look too sloppy. It'll look too knee-jerk. It'll look too simplistic. You know, simple is good. Simplistic is dangerous in this world. Categories won't go away completely, but we'll at least be much more mindful and thoughtful about it when we do it. So back to the tables, back to the upper part. This is plausible, internally consistent, provocative, and we're usually right. Uh, so that's that kind of forecast. Uh, it's not a prediction. but puzzle with this a bit. You know, where do you see examples of full spectrum thinking in your business? Where do you see examples of categorical? Where might you have a different view from this? Again, five minutes. Thank you. OK, welcome back. Welcome back. I'm going to start up above, first of all. Any uh, a question or a comment from up above? Please, all the way to the back, can you see? Uh, do you mind walking out to the aisle a little bit there? Is there a mic over there? Oh, I've, I've got one. Is it on? You got one? OK. OK, great. Hi there. Um, I'm Sheila Frierson. I'm a graduate of Grazia Bio uh, MBA program. Oh, great. Um, I, I love your voice. Will you project a little? It's kind of you're the voice of God for us. So this <laughs> Absolutely. Is um, I'm also the president of a financial services company. Um, I work here in LA. Great. I travel a lot. Um, anyway, I was um, just thinking about how this is practically working out and how I create strategy and how I work with the executives globally mm. at my company. And I find that we're trying to think of more solutions, or myself and my team, in more of a full spectrum, spectrum thinking. Nice. But I'm presenting to a lot of what I'd call category, you know, uh, more of the categorological thinkers, right? right? So how do you begin to influence that change? Um, you know, I'm here today, and you know, it, you know, kind of that old way of thinking into the new. Mm -hmm. or, do you have any tips for that? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, so I think the beginning of it is just to suggest a model like this, that there is a directional shift. Often foresight is a good way to provoke a conversation or an insight, even if you don't agree with the foresight. Um, and introducing something like this, I think, can begin a conversation on a safe ground. Uh, thinking about the future is often safer than talking about the present and getting embroiled in, in the, the current debates. 
I think you can also use analogies from different fields. I've been surprised since I've been writing the book about how far the medical profession has come in this kind of thinking in medical schools and in some specific fields. Um, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, even 10 years ago, uh, someone who had Asperger's or autism was categorized as a noun. It was said that person has autism and it was, it was viewed as a problem. Now, any of you uh, who know about Silicon Valley know that we've got a lot of people in Silicon Valley who are on the spectrum, uh, who are very highly functioning, who are very creative. Uh, and what the medical community has done now is start talk about uh, autism, not as a noun, as a category, but they're talking about autism spectrum disorders. And they don't talk about Asperger's at all anymore. Uh, and if you go on the website and track down the current definitions, there's, there's pros and there's cons. And I'm not denying there are problems. There obviously are problems, depending on where you live on the spectrum. But the fact that the spectrum has become part of a positive conversation in Silicon Valley, that's really interesting. There's programs at Stanford, at UCLA. Uh, SAP is actually recruiting people on the spectrum now. And at Institute for the Future, we're seeing resumes where people say proudly, I'm on the spectrum, as an example of how they can think differently. And of course, at Institute for the Future, we, we love that. Uh, just this last fall, uh, the first college basketball player on the autism spectrum received a full Division I basketball scholarship. And, the, and this, this player from Louisiana went to Kent State because of the services they, they had there. So I think that's an example. And as you're trying to introduce this conversation, if you can pull out some practical examples, I'm happy to share the ones I've seen. So a comment or a question down on the floor, please. Right over here. Thank you. Would you mind standing up and introducing yourself? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bobby Thomason. I'm a, an assistant professor of applied behavioral sciences. Nice. This uh, section really resonated uh, with me and our table. So we had a significant mass of professors uh, in our <laughs> conversation. And we got thinking about all the ways in which we aspire to full spectrum thinking. In our work, it's about combining rigor and relevance, about yes. caring about teaching and research. And then in the course of our day, our actions or incentives or rewards, uh, there are so many pulls into categorical thinking. Yes. And so we talked a bit about what are the challenges? Is it nice. that we don't have the tools, Very the good. time? So yes. could you speak to sure. what you think of as the challenges and then what sure. are the ways that we overcome those? Sure. Are, are you mostly at Pepperdine, your professors? Yes. Um, have you thought about talking to your dean? We, we do. He's been great about being in conversation with us about this. It is certainly a, a conversation. So I, I think you're, I'm really pleased with that question. And I think the challenge for us all is there's a high, what I used to think of, I'm, I'm trained in sociology, there's a high face validity. You kind of look at this and you say, oh yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm not arguing that it's new. The only part I'm arguing that it's new is that we're over categorizing, I think, particularly in politics and dangerously so. Uh, and then we have all these new tools that are new. In your fields, in the behavioral sciences, did you notice last week Nature Magazine received a petition from 800 scientists arguing that they should stop using significance testing and stop using p-values? Uh, not because they're wrong, but because they've been taken too seriously. You know, and categorizing if something is insignificant as P less than 0 0.05, it's written off as a failed project. And the point these scientists make is that's not true. It's actually a spectrum of possibilities being explored and significance tests were just too simplistic. So I found that intriguing. That's not gonna happen overnight, but I think those are what we call signals again that you could, you could build on. So I'd like to ask on the final countdown, can we just go ahead now? I'm not gonna do small groups. You all are doing so well on questions. I'm just gonna open it to questions from the floor after this round. So would you mind starting my countdown till the end of the session, please? Thank you. Okay, so here are the new leadership literacies. This is in the book that I mentioned earlier, the new leadership literacies. I've already shared with you the core literacy, looking back from the future but acting now. 
using foresight inside action. I'm going to now give you a, a bit of a quick deep dive into voluntary fear and shape shifting. But before I do that, I want to just touch on the two we're not going to have time to talk about. As you think 10 years ahead, if you're a leader in a distributed organization, you're going to have to be better if you're not there physically than if you are. And most of today's leaders are great in person. But if they're not there physically, they degrade. You know, they're not very good at social media. They can't even run very good conference calls. Uh, they're not very good in video. They're just not good if they're not there. And that just won't be acceptable. So if you look 10 years ahead, it's obvious the tools are getting so much better now. I mean, just think about today's video conferencing with things like Zoom or GoToMeeting, and pretty soon the audio is going to be just as good in those kind of things. Uh, you, you know, Dolby and BlueJeans are working together now. So uh, that's, that's good and so much better. But you've got to learn how to use it. It isn't just a routine thing. So you've got to be better when you're not there physically. And finally, um, all of you, all of us, in leadership roles, 10 years from now, you're going to have to be super healthy. Super healthy. Not just healthy, super healthy. You're going to have to have physical fitness, mental fitness, and even spiritual fitness, but not necessarily religion, just a sense of balance as you face, face the scramble. So what we think of as video gaming today, this may be the most outrageous forecast I share with you today. What we think of video gaming today, and I want you to just pause for a moment now and think in your mind, video gaming, positive, negative? And particularly for you all who are parents, I'll bet most of you are negative. And you're worried about controlling your kids' access to video games. Here's my forecast. 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, what we used to call video gaming, it's the most powerful learning medium in history. In history. Why? Because the interfaces are so much better. Now, I'm not saying that many of today's video games aren't too violent and too sexual. I think they are. I'm not saying you turn your loose, kids loose in this world, but I'm saying you go there with the, your kids and help them make smart and reasonable and moral choices. But you can't just say no, and you can't limit screen time. Screen time's a silly measure. Ten years from now, Everything's going to be a screen. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to measure screen time. It only makes sense to measure what's the experience through the screen. That's the power. So I'll give you an example, another signal. You all know what it is, but I'm going to give it in another context. This happened uh, last August on the 11th. Uh, an employee at SeaTac Airport stole an aircraft. And it wasn't just any aircraft. It was a Bombardier Dash 8 Q400. So those of you who are pilots, my pilot friend tell us that is an impossible plane to fly. It's so complicated that they never imagined that anybody would steal it, so it wasn't even locked. <laughs> it wasn't even locked. But here is how it happened. On the left is the real cockpit. On the right is the virtual reality cockpit from a video game. Very realistic. Now, we knew about pilot simulators. That's old news. We didn't know that young people like this, this is the plane thief, <laughs> that young people like this could steal an aircraft. And they, they, he was doing amazing things, flying this plane in stunts. And the control tower says, where did you learn to be a pilot? We didn't know you were a pilot. And he said, well, I played a few video games. I played a few video games. This is going to be the most powerful learning medium in history. This is just a hint. And what function, what function is going to become gamers? What function? Please? What function? What is it? Everyone. I think that's close. Uh, when you have the, your gathering of the 60th reunion, you're going to all be gamers. You're going to all be gamers. Not today's video games, but the medium of gaming, that powerful learning medium. The function that's going to take the lead in this, I think, and this is going to surprise you, is human resources. <laughs> I mean, they haven't stepped up to any technology yet. Um, 
but I think they will this time. I think they will. Uh, and I think it might be so extreme that we don't think of HR, you know, HR is a term that is just kind of devalued now. 10 years from now, it might be HCR because it's human computing resources. And we've got machine learning now, we've got gaming, and uh, I, I think this is a great career opportunity for human resource people. Obviously, they need the IT people, but they need the social side, and that's what HR should have. So here's the organizations. This is the organization of the future. Um, this is what it's gonna look like, so this gamefully engaged, organization of the future will be like, I call it a shape-shifting organization. It has no center, more distributed authority and governance, less centralized, and again, anything that can be distributed will be distributed, amplified by this next generation of packet switching in the internet. Hierarchies will come and go. We'll still have hierarchies, but it'll be more liquid, liquid data, liquid organizations. Grows from the edges where diversity flourishes. Uh, unfiltered spectrum diversity. I, I went to divinity school at the divinity school Martin Luther King went to, and I was there when he was killed. And in those days, um, the notion of diversity and inclusion was all about equity, and it still is about equity, but now it's about innovation too. And now we've got these opportunities to engage with people much more inclusively than we ever had before. Again, a kind of spectrum inclusion. And then finally, can't be controlled, but can be guided. So here's a project we're working on with Cisco, um, and it's in VR. So this is done in Vive, uh, uh, written, the software is written in any land. Uh, and these are real people, and this is the Cisco prototype organization chart. So instead of the hierarchical, rigid thing that most of our companies run on, it's all fluid. It includes full-time employees and also um, workers of any kind, and it's project-based. Uh, it's partly uh, fed by descriptions of roles and partly fed by behavior, you know, who talks to whom and how frequently. But this is clearly the direction we're moving six, uh, 10 years from now. We're going to all have animated org charts. That's just the way it's gonna to have to be. The question is just how do, we get, how do we get from here to there? So I wanna give you an example, a particularly inspiring one, of how these shape-shifting organizations can be created. And there's lots of negative ones, but I wanna share a positive one. Uh, this is um, Greta Thunberg from Sweden. She's 15 years old. And I'm showing you a little clip that has gone viral from one of her presentations at the UN. And I should mention, she's said proudly that she's on the spectrum, which I think is also really interesting. But she's had such a powerful, such a powerful impact. So I'm going to play a little clip from her speaking at this US UN gathering. She's the inspiration behind Fridays for Future. Uh, and then I'm going to give you the data as of last week. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of climate justice now. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. 
It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Look at those eyes, look at those eyes. And just for a moment, just for a moment, close your eyes and remember back to when you were 15 years old. I could never have imagined doing anything like that. But this is the kind of young person that is growing up in this world, the true digital natives. And last Friday, there was 1.6 million students walked out of schools in 20 different countries. Very powerful, started in Europe, um, led by her, but she's not the executive. There's all these volunteers that created shape-shifting organizations to make this concept work. So here's what it's going to look like 10 years from now. And again, I think this is a sure thing, and we'll open it to some final questions, and then we'll break. Um, watch the animation and watch it very closely, because it's not just a shape-shifting organization. Particularly, you think of, of the organization that Greta seeded. Um, it's not just a single organization. It's a landscape that's being created, all amplified by digital media that are distributed authority computing devices that all began with packet switching, of course, but now scaling way beyond it. So this is what the landscape looks like. So I met with the CEO of a very large corporation recently, and I was in his very large office on the other side of the very large desk, and I showed this to him. I spun my MacBook over and showed it to him, and he looked at me and he said, he kind of leaned across his desk, and he stuck his chin out, and he said, where do I sit? <laughs> That's a really good question. The answer is at the foundation. It's not at the top, except periodically. But this is, uh, you know, we've got a panel this afternoon um, that is focusing on leadership traits led by um, a leader from McKinsey. McKinsey first talked, the way I remember it, about servant leadership and about leadership from behind. Um, this is the rebirth of both of those concepts. So the hierarchies will come and go, and there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is um, more flexibility to scale up and down. Um, there's more ways to make a living, and this is great if you're ready for freelancing. So if you're on a very humanistic platform like Upwork, which is based in Silicon Valley, the longest running, the most humanistic, you can have, you can make two to 300K a year as a programmer or, or a designer. Uh, you can have healthcare benefits, you can have retirement planning, and according to the US government, you won't have a job. That's really interesting. So these young people could have the opportunity to have a very successful life without ever having a job. On the other hand, the bad news is, criminals are better at shape-shifting than the rest of us. So when I show this to my colleagues, the new three stars at the War College, the NSA, who does this remind you of? The first thing they say is Al-Qaeda. This is Al-Qaeda. This is the way they work. ISIS is more hierarchical, they tell me, but Al-Qaeda is very much like this. Fewer traditional jobs inevitably. And the issue in Silicon Valley, it's so hot right now, how do you track career paths across organizations when money's not enough and titles don't matter? It's a real different, different world. Uh, and then finally, it's awful if you can't adapt to the gig economy and freelance work. If you try to make a living on Amazon Turk, that's like slave labor. It's micro tasks for micro pennies. So this is all what I call an economy of organization, not just an economy of scale. And you will be, you will be what you can organize. So this is my last forecast I want to share with you. And um, thank you so much for being so engaged in the table conversations. And now I'm just going to open it up and trust that I'll continue to get such great questions and comments. Uh, can we start with somebody down here on the ground level? Question or comment? Question over here. Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Would you mind standing up? 
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Faye McClure. I'm a member of the Pepperdine Board of Regents. Oh, great. I'm an alum of Seaver College. Nice. And uh, I started my own company about a year ago, wow. an insurance company. I've worked in the uh, insurance corporate world for, let's say, many, many years. Wow, good for you. Would yeah. you say your new company is kind of a shape-shifting organization? Yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah. I would say that. But my question is uh, regarding the other slide that you shared about the full-spectrum thinking. Yep. And uh, in corporate America, we're taught, and I was a senior executive for many years, and we're always taught, here are the rules, here are the processes, but how do you think out of the box, think beyond the obvious right. and, and look beyond? And my question is more is how does that differ out of the box thinking from what we describe or what you're describing as full spectrum thinking or is there a difference between the two? So um, thank you for asking that, um, very helpful. So out of the box thinking would be step one and full spectrum would be about step 10. So in other words, you're going directionally right but full spectrum thinking is looking more toward the spectrum. So if you go back to um, the conversation from Zach Anderson, the big data analytics guy. What he's saying is he doesn't like normal curves. He doesn't like statistics because that takes him away from the data. But if you look at big data analytics and visualization 10 years from now, you'll literally be able to step into the distribution, into the data. That's a lot more than out of the box. That's beyond the whole concept of boxes. It's thinking about data as a spectrum, as an array. Uh, and even if you imagine the next version of haptic interfaces, you'll actually be able to feel your presence in the data rather than these kind of abstractions that are away. So it's directionally correct. It's just that we're gonna have the opportunity to go way beyond. The second signal I'd share, and this just happened in Silicon Valley, and I'll, I'll send you the link if you wanna go check it. There's a new uh, startup called Soap AI. S-O-A-P-A-I, and I think it's just soapai.net. It's founded by Karen Edwards. Uh, the, the, she was the original chief marketing officer at Yahoo. She's the one who coined the Do You Yahoo, uh, and she's an amazing, amazing entrepreneur. And she and a team of machine learning people created a kid-oriented interface for fake news. So basically, it's a filter that allows it's, the interface is one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. It's all bubbles. Uh, it allows young people, because they're the target audience, anybody can use it, but they're the target audience, young people to see the, the spectrum of what's being said, not just to look at it within boxes. Okay, another, yes, please. Yeah, Alan, so yeah, so speak of McKinsey and McKinsey Rises. This is good. <laughs> Please. Uh, Alan Webb, yeah, editor-in-chief of the McKinsey Quarterly. You sort of glossed over the voluntary fear engagement one. I wonder if you could say a little more about that and how it fits with this model of flexibility. Yeah, yeah. glossed over. <laughs> I missed it. Maybe I missed it. Yeah. These McKinsey guys are tough. This is something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, when I was talking about gameful engagement, I was actually talking about voluntary fear engagement. They're, they're the same thing. That's the same literacy. And the reason I call it voluntary fear is because I find the VUCA world truly frightening, the, the next decade we're, we're going into. So I think if we want to engage and gamefully engage with the VUCA world, with the scramble, we've got to realize we have to become frightened. Uh, and, it's, and we have to play through the fear. So this is the root of wargaming. Um, I did an event at the wargame where I invited some McKinsey people, I invited some Procter & Gamble people, uh, and we had state-of-the-art video game designers, state-of-the-art wargame designers, and state-of-the-art corporate game designers. The wargame designers were way ahead of us on, on realism. Uh, if you go to the National Training Center in the Mojave Desert, it's, I think of it as the world's largest gaming parlor. It's about the size of the state of Rhode Island. It has real tanks, real Afghan actors, and they play for two weeks, 24 hours a day. And many people are killed without having to die. That's voluntary fear. The, the video game designers were way ahead of the, of the military and the corporate designers on user interface. Their interface designs for today's video games were at least 10 times better than anything we have in offices, even if we use the Macs or the Surface. Um, the corporate gamers were behind on everything. All they had were very traditional business school-like simulations of the current world, not the VUCA world. So how much time do we have left again? Total, excuse me? One? 
One minute, I see. <laughs> that suggests I need to close, and I can't gloss over anything, so this is a real challenge. Uh, uh, so um, I've been doing this almost 40 years. This is the most frightening 10-year forecast I've ever done. And, and it's the most hopeful. And it's the most hopeful. It's like the stakes are off. And I've been saying that every year for the last 10 years. <laughs> It's just like we're going into an increasingly high stakes game, but as a game, it's a game that's all about hope. It's a game that's all about hope. And I'm particularly interested in young people, 23 or less. Those are the young people I think are the true digital natives. Millennials are really interesting. Uh, they've added a lot, but they're not digital natives. It's the 23 or less who are gonna create the disruption. And it's the 23 or less that are, if they have hope, going to change the world like we see with, with Greta. So if they have hope, I'm very optimistic. If they don't have hope, they become depressed or dangerous. Those are the same people who get recruited to join ISIL. So I'm very hopeful, um, and I think that we all have reason to be concerned about the future. I'm going to stay with you the whole day. Thank you for all you're doing here at Pepperdine. Thank you for your thought about leadership. Thank you.